My maternal grandfather used to say, dal destino non si sfugge, which in Italian means from destiny you can't run. My destiny is that I'm in this room. Because about 37 years ago, this month, my mom found out she was pregnant. And the stage was set for me to be here. Because the stage was set for me to be here before I was even conceived. I've always been into genealogy, family history. My mom's family, straight from Italy. My grandparents came over from Italy when my grandmother was pregnant with my mom. I, I'm the one who keeps in touch with all the family in Italy, all my grandmother's sisters, all cousins. I'm the one who keeps up that correspondence now that my grandparents have passed. My dad is a, a mutt, you know, American mutt, you know, Dutch and German and French and English and Belgian and Irish, that whole mix. Um, it's never as into that. I always felt very Italian, very Mediterranean. Um, but as I grew up, I was interested in my dad's genealogy. So I did the ancestry research. One of his cousins had done a lot of research via the census and everything. So I kind of retraced his steps. And my my dad's mother was a, a member of the, the Wyckoff family, which is one of the first Dutch families that settled in New Amsterdam. So I thought that was really cool. Um, so I, I, I did connect to that side of my family. So I always wanted to do one of these DNA tests. You know, we first heard of them. But I was, you know, just out of college. It used to be really expensive. So I put it off, you know? And in the summer of 2017, um, a friend of mine said, oh my gosh, 23 Me is doing a DNA research study um, on depression and bipolar disorder. And I've had issues with depression since I was a teenager, and um, so did my dad. Um, and it's always something very important to me, raising awareness about that. So I said, oh my gosh, this is perfect, it's free, free. Free DNA test, I know, right? Free DNA test, doing like research about mental health, you know, trying to find genes associated with various things. Perfect, perfect. So I did the test. Now that I look back on it, my mom saw me spitting, spitting into the tube, and she kind of had a sick look on her face, but you know. <laughs> I'm looking back. Um, I get my results on uh, September 26th of 2017. Open up my results. It's about to go to bed. It's like one o'clock in the morning. I'm just checking my email to see if my friend has sent me a picture of her baby. Um, and I see the results. I open them up, and the first thing I see is 49 point something percent Ashkenazi Jewish. <laughs> Whoa! Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! So my grand, my my maternal grandparents, like I said, from Italy. Um, people always thought my grandfather was Jewish, you know? Um, he lived in Brooklyn, he had, he had the mannerisms, he had the nose, whatever he was. You know, he, he had that way of speaking. A lot of people thought he was Jewish. So my first thing is, oh my gosh, no one was really Jewish. He was part Jewish. And then I'm like, that's 50%, how does that work? Oh my gosh, maybe they were Italian Jews. I reached out to one of my friends who's Jewish and really the genealogy, and she's trying to Research this with me. She stayed up with me till like four o'clock in the morning. Um, we were researching conversions and stuff. And I'm like, how does this work with my dad? It's 50 percent. My dad had like his grandmother had like a German last name. Maybe she was a German Jew somehow. And, like together that adds up to 50 percent. You know. <laughs> um, finally, my friend says to me about four o'clock in the morning. She said, Cassandra. <coughs> You know your dad has British ancestry. You know it. You know he had a, a big chunk British. You know it's in his, his you know, in his uh, pedigree line there. You're zero percent British. <laughs> She's like something's going on. You know it became clear at this point. At that point, you know the we you know, all know the results get refined and stuff. But at the time, you know my Italian side was still in the mix of like Southern Europe, Middle East. You know, so it wasn't quite as clear, but at that point, I started to look at the results, and I was like, oh my gosh, it really is, it's 50% Italian and 50% Jewish. Something's going on. My friend says, look at your matches. And I had looked at them, but you know, it didn't really sink in, but I had a half-sister match. And 23andMe, for those of you tested, does a little bit better with, with the predictions. So I had a half-sister match. Um, my friend says, there you go. You know, there's something going on. And 
I'm just racking my brain. I'm like, my mom, my mom's, a, I'm a goody two-shoes. My mom is super goody two-shoes, you know? <laughs> my mom never would have had an affair. She could have told me a million times. My dad was the only person she was with, you know, like, not just before marriage, all of this stuff. I, I couldn't comprehend it. I could not comprehend it. So in the middle of all this, I had messaged my mom at first. I'm like, oh my gosh, you guys are Jewish. Little Nono was probably, my little Nono was my grandpa. He was probably part Jewish. And she just kind of sent me the thumbs up, you know, <laughs> in the middle of the night. <laughs> so she was actually coming over the next morning. I was going to therapy because my life was kind of in a hard place already at that time. There was marriage issues. My dad was having it, some mental health issues. There was already a lot going on. So don't keep secrets because they tend to come out at like the worst times <laughs> when things are already kind of chaotic. So I said, Mommy, can you come over a little bit earlier to watch my daughter before I go to therapy? She's like, thumbs up. <laughs> so <coughs> she comes over, she's tense, she sits down. Mommy, what's going on? <laughs> At that point, I kind of had realized. I had called 23andMe, and they said there's no mix-up. You know, there's <laughs> we we don't do that. We don't mix up our samples anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're in really good safeguards. You know, it's just it was just clicking that that he was probably not my father. It took a few hours, but it's clicking. And I said to my mom, "Mommy, it's not my dad, is he?" I. Why didn't you tell me? What, what, what happened? I couldn't even comprehend what, what the answer could be. What happened, Mommy? Daddy couldn't have kids. So we used a donor. <sighs> Mommy, why didn't you tell me? We didn't upset you at all the things. And it was a very surreal moment. Um, my daughter was 19 months old at the time. She was playing in the corner. And all of a sudden, the, the identity that had already started to kind of fade away as the night progressed, as I didn't sleep, just completely, completely crumbled and fell. And I had no idea who, who half of me was, as you all know. And the first, one of the first things I said was, Mommy, what about breast cancer? My boobs, Mommy. <laughs> <laughs> Because I, before I started researching nothing but sperm, sperm donation industry, <laughs> I was, and I still am, a big avid breastfeeder. So that was kind of my main area of research, you know, and I was breastfeeding my daughter. So that was really one of the first health-related concerns that came into my mind, because I have a lot of friends who are Jewish. I know they're, you know, the BRCA gene. A lot of that runs in Ashkenazi Jewish families. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I was about to turn 35 in about three weeks, which is the age when they start doing testing all right, or pre, you know, even earlier if you have the family history, but at least by that age, if you have, have you know, those genes. And I was like, mommy, like, I'm still feeding my daughter. What if, what if all this man's sister is all had breast cancer? Well, I don't know, how can you not, how could you not tell me? And you know, it's been a long journey <laughs> in, that, in that regard. But um, I said, so mommy, who was it? You know, who, how, did you have any information? No information. I was conceived in February of 1982, born in October of 1982. At that time, you know, while some people from that time do have some, some records, where my mom, her OBGYN, basically did not keep anything. There was basically no record that it occurred. She was never given any paperwork. You know, she just kept saying, they told me they used healthy doctors. They told me they were healthy doctors, healthy doctors. I'm like, yes, of course they were. I'm sure they were healthy at the time. She said, they said they were tested. They said they were tested all of this. But that doesn't tell me anything about your health history going forward, if that was even true, which after I met my biological father, I found that they did not ask them any health questions. Uh, so, no. no. <laughs> so, all she knew was that one of the days when she was inseminated, her, I was conceived in Westchester County, New York, was that, was that um, one of the days she was inseminated, her doctor told her that he had driven from Long Island with the sample. So literally one of the first images of my biological father I had was a doctor driving down like the Long Island Expressway with like a little cup of me. A little cup of me like, in a couple, 
like driving down. Like, and I'm like, I was in a cup. <laughs> you don't realize <laughs> how much you m miss the idea or take for granted the idea that two people were together in your conception, that there was some kind of relation there. So when I looked at my half-sister match, I looked up her last name on Google, and I found that there were three doctors on Long Island with that last name. So my search for my biological father was very easy, thankfully. Um, I figured right away that she was probably his, his child that he had raised, and I was right. I messaged her within like two or three days after I found out, and she was, she was very nice. She told me, yes, it was their father. I actually just found out about a month before because someone had popped up on Ancestry. So I have, uh, he has three children that he raised in his marriage, and then so far I have one other donor sibling who found out just about a month before me, and I have a nice relationship with him. After I met one of my five fathers, uh, his, his oldest son from his marriage, and he gave me some health information and stuff, he goes, would you like my dad's email address? And I was like, yes, <laughs> sure. Um, and I started emailing with my bio dad, and we've met twice so far. He's a busy guy, uh, he's a retired OBGYN, and I have never had such a beautifully traumatic experience in my life as meeting a man who smiles the way I do, as soon as he turned around and looked at me, who is so much of me, so much of me. He, I mean, he told me things like right from like the deepest places of my soul, you know, the first, like just because he knows that, he knows it, he could tell. So since that time, I've gotten really involved in in advocacy and around the issue of sperm and egg donation. I'm actually working in New Jersey. I live in New Jersey with one of the assembly women there to regulate the industry because there really are no regulations. There's no records have to be kept for 10 years, which since a lot of donor conceived people don't even find out that they're donor conceived until they're adult, is not enough. So we're working on regulations about limiting number of siblings so that I can have dozens out there that will never know. And it's, it's just a crazy, crazy world. So I've done a lot of, of work there. I've also done a lot regarding Judaism, exploring it. I help moderate the NPE Jewish Heritage Group. So that has been Jewish Heritage. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> it's awesome. It's an amazing little group of people who are exploring all kinds of aspects of Judaism in just amazing ways. And it's, it's been fulfilling. And I've also kind of wanted to talk a little bit about two of the things that, that kind of come to mind. Two wor biggest words that come to mind when I, when I talk about this are, are dignity and, and humanity. Those are things that I think we've all been robbed of. And those are the things that I'm striving to, to get back. And especially with sperm donation, with kind of commodification, the way we feel like a purchase or like a sale really even plays even deeper into that sense of like dignity of our right to our own body, the right to know some very integral information about who we are. And when you look at like the the rights that adopted people in New York are fight, currently fighting for to open up their original birth certificates, sperm donation and egg donation are like 20 or 30 years behind adoption as far as people realizing the importance of being able to have access to this person, their medical history, their identity, their personality quirks, because that's so much. Any of you who've met your bio fathers know those personality quirks and everything that, that, that somehow gets passed along, even if you didn't even know they existed for decades, you know? And to say that this whole experience is about increasing the empathy for people not just in our situation, but anybody in a situation that has been put in a place where we don't have things that other people take for granted. You know, where we don't have to get triggered by writing our names down or by seeing parents and children out in the playground and scanning their faces quickly to see if they look like they're related, you know? It's about really getting into that. And I, I really, I try to be open with that, with my journey. I try to be open not only about best practices and getting donation, but also about, you know, relating to one another in, in a way that expands all of our hearts. You know, I'm currently in treatment for PTSD from all of this, and it really, it, it, it takes a lot out of us to go through this. You know, there's a lot of processing your whole lives in a new way. Um, and I, I, I enjoy being open about it because I want people to be able to be open about that experience too. And I want to thank 
you guys so much for allowing us that. <laughs>